Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at RyanRoxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of In the Trenches. I am your host, Ryan Roxy. What is happening, everybody? Um, I'm back. I'm back in the blue room. Uh, back home in Sweden at the North Pole. And this is basically, I'm outdoors. And this is the way ice looks on camera, apparently. No, I'm in my comfortable studio. It's nice and toasty. I'm getting ready for a great episode as I let you guys just filter in to the live chat, filter into the room. Hello, everybody in the live chat. If you're listening to us on the audio broadcast, thank you very much for doing that. But you know what we want you to do? I want you to be on Ryan Roxy Official, our YouTube channel. That is youtube.com, Ryan Roxy Official. Hit that subscribe button that our illustrious producer, Vic Chalfant, just put up there. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. It helps with the algorithm. It helps the algorithm gods uh, get more eyeballs on the podcast, and that's ultimately what we want to do. So, again, I uh, we just wrapped up an Alice Cooper, wrapped up the whole year of touring, basically. It was our last show of the year. We just did... Um, private show, private Halloween show in New Orleans. But before that, we did a really cool show with the Misfits and the band called Fear. And we did that in Texas. And we also played in Tulsa. So a way to just sort of uh, end a really great touring year with Alice and looking forward to the next year. A whole bunch of new stuff coming up, uh, new announcements coming up. But hey, that's for another day, another podcast. It's in the trenches time right now. Let's dive in. Um, I've been wanting to have our guest on the pod for a long time. We've been talking about it ever since we toured uh, alongside each other in the Alice Cooper band and the Ace Frehley bands, respectively. Uh, The biggest reason I wanted him on is because I found his drumming solid, his personality friendly, but his history and story, if you will, a bit mysterious, right? He's played in the same circle of musicians that I have, yet we've never played in the same band together, to my knowledge. He's, he's into mentoring and self-help courses, as I am, as you know that, but I have never had that same conversation with him. So what a better way to have that place, to, what a better place to have that conversation than right here in the trenches so we can discuss all things music and mindset. So please welcome into the trenches, drummer, producer, and mentor to many, Matt Starr. Hello, Matt. Hey, howdy. What's going on, bud? Just hanging out, talking to you. <laughs> I was thinking the 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 background is like the ABBA Voulez Vous album. You could just tell everyone it's an ABBA inspired. That it's everything is usually ABBA inspired on the show because I am in Sweden. I do think that SOS was probably the best rock pop song ever written. One of you know people ask me what your what your favorite song is, and they are a little bit shocked when I say SOS. But the Voulez Vous album. If I remember correctly, um, had a blue background, kind of like what we're on, uh, and all four members were against this blue background. Was it the same album, or just around that same era of time where they had the helicopter album, or was that Arrival? That's Arrival, which is such a great, great, great shot. The <laughs> all the clear glass and everything. Do you have, I mean, I know it's such a generic question to ask, but do you have a favorite rock song? Because for me, the best two. Uh, songs and they're not I guess anthems or, or or anything like that but SOS like I mentioned from ABBA and the song Surrender from Cheap Trick those to me are the best written rock pop songs of all time do you have one yourself Go yeah to. I think probably favorite song would be either Be My Baby yeah I, th- I think Be My Baby the Ronettes tune yeah Ronnie you Spector know, it's just and- perfect Great drum intro, great hooks. There's emotion in there. The writing's great. The story, it's teenage love. It's just kind of everything. And it's got the wall of sound, the Phil Spector wall of sound, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure Phil produced that. Yeah. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. He did. Is that, I mean, because I did introduce you as drummer, producer. Um, I'm sure you being a drummer, 
you probably play a lot of other instruments as well, because most drummers that I uh, we have on the podcast um, actually play guitar better than myself, mm-hmm. and they write great songs. Um, it seems that drummers wear a lot of hats, you yeah. know, and they and a lot of drummers become lead singers. So, what for you? And I guess we could start the animation off because it is a regular in the trenches rock show, don't you think, Vic? We have to go back to get forward. <laughs> Okay, Matt Starr, throwing you in. Uh, what? Oh, we lost Matt Starr. Well, what happened? There you go. There you go. Here I am. <laughs> I was expecting me to be like half split screen there with Matt Starr. And there he is. He's coming back. Don't worry, folks. It's all good. You got a phone call, didn't you? No, it just like just went away. I, I'm on. I got do not disturb happening. All right, cool. So. And you got your and you got your uh, uh, your power plug in and all that kind yes. of stuff. All, all right, cool. Up. I mean, Vic Chalfont, he trains them well. I'm telling you, he trains all of our guests. They have a sound check. They go through it. But you know what? Every once in a while, that's the beauty of a live stream. That's why you know it's a live stream. Things like this happen. But what was the instrument that s- sort of started it all off? So in my head, it was guitar. So we had growing up a store called J.C. Penny, which was, oh, I remember J. C. you know, Penny. Right. So they had the JCPenney catalog, which was like a phone book. It was basically an analog version of Amazon. And they had everything in there from car tires to, you know, beds to guitars. And so I would look through there and just look at all this cool stuff, bikes, all these things. And one year I found uh, I was in fourth grade and I found a guitar. It was a Les Paul, Cherry Burst, like Aces, you know, kind of thing. And an amp. And I circled them and I said, that's what I want for Christmas. And my parents would never tell me what we were getting that always go okay th- you know we'll, we'll keep it in mind which i think is great because i had Put friends on that the knew list. what they were getting yeah. yeah and so i never knew but that one year my mom goes okay okay yeah here i am this is this is 1979 right. i am uh that was a sweatshirt that i cut up and sewed. i'm wearing my mom's winter boots i kept telling her mom you should get black ones she goes, why am I, I'm, you know. <laughs> and I have the right pair from this J.C. Penny catalog if you want to check it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I wanted to get the guitar. I didn't get a guitar for Christmas. I was feeling sorry for myself. And mom goes, well, why don't you play drums? And I said, ah, I don't know. I want to play drums. And she said, you could join the school band. So I did. So I wanted to play guitar. And within a few weeks, I uh, started my drumming expedition. And, and from the pictures, folks, it definitely looks like you definitely took a uh, sewing class at one point as an elective and maybe. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, shirt? Shirt, that shirt fell off the laundry line and my dad ran it over with the lawnmower. It was my new Van Halen shirt. And I was like, no. And I looked at it and I put it on and I go, that is actually better. <laughs> so yeah. I just went with it. You have like a relic uh a relic van halen shirt authentic you know right. it's not even road it's not even road worthy it's it's more like a lawn worthy or lawn lawn worn i guess yes. you know yeah like a, a landscaping <laughs> uh abuse they used to shoot them like in la they they would shoot the shirts with a, a shotgun shells right you know to get yes. those holes but lawn you know run over by a lawnmower we might have something there. It's a whole new business uh, angle, which you're yeah. always talking about. And we're going to get into that, um, about how you can make money when you sleep and have new ideas and how you always have to, as musicians, we always have to be sort of always be thinking ahead of the game, a little bit more entrepreneurial, uh, maybe lawnmower uh, relicking, lawnmower shredding shirts is the new wave. I don't know. I think you just line up the whole yard with Van Halen, Kiss, Motley Crue, Cheap Trick, ACDC shirts. Yeah, there I am. And then just fire up the lawnmower and then just mow the lawn. Just run over all these shirts and then however they come out, no two are alike, right? The crazy thing is it's not going to be a Van Halen shirt anymore. These days it's going to be a Nerd Halen shirt you right. know, or, a, or a Steel Panther shirt. It'll be a band that has sort of, you know – pattern themselves out of after those bands that we all listen to and maybe it first started as a parody but now becomes more and more a real band and, and more credible band and of course you know has 
multiple guitar effects like Satchel does. <laughs> yeah, well, that was the thing with Panther that was so funny. It was like kind of the monkey story, like, okay, this is one thing. And then it like comes to life and turns into a real thing. And I mean, bless those guys. They were, they're great friends of mine and they're all really talented, but it's like, wait, this was a joke. It's like, not anymore. That's, that's, you know what? I never made that comparison. And for those of you that know the monkeys, uh, it was a television show back in the seventies. Again, started off as just sort of a, a parody of, of the Beatles in a way, the monkeys, right, so the Beatles, you get, you get it just like that. But then they became a real band because they were real musicians and they had real songs and real hit because they had, I believe the California Mafia or the uh, Sunset Mafia. What, what was it called? The hit, the hit squad, the hit team. Um, yeah, like Don Kirshner's writers, like uh, Neil Diamond and all these kinds yeah. of people were writing songs for them. Yeah, and then the, then they started having the hits, and then they had careers. And you know what? I I think the Monkees. Um, is there some version today, or they, have they all passed? I know Mickey Dolan's is still alive with us, but I think the the rest of all the Monkees have passed. They have all passed. Mike Nesmith was the most recent one. Yeah. So, but he but not Mickey Dolan's. Mickey Dolan's is still, is still there. Nope. There you go. Mickey's Mickey's good in the upper right there. That's Mickey. Yep. Yeah. And for those of you that want to keep score at home, keep that picture up there, Vic. There you go. Uh, Mickey Dolan's up there, upper right hand corner is one of the original Hollywood vampires. Mm -hmm. Huh? 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 There you go. It's not only entertaining, Matt Star, when you're on the podcast. It's going to be, uh, it, it's educational, not just entertaining, it's educational. And that's what we're going to get into. Um, your education, your musical education, because at this point you've played with some definite iconic legendary names, you know, Joe Lynn Turner from Deep Purple, the name comes up plus his solo stuff, uh, Kevin Dubrow, Quiet Riot, uh, Ace Fraley, who you currently play with and who you currently had the, you know, Peter Chris's outfit on oh so many years ago. Um, that whole education of growing up playing, uh, listening to that type of music, did you ever think that you would be playing for those types of bands? Yeah, I think the kid in me, like guys have said, like, oh, when you got the Ace gig or when you play with Paul Stanley, you know, the the kid in you must have been freaking out. And the kid in me was actually like, yeah, of course, this is what we were doing all along. We were just pretending and now we're actually doing it. Uh, the adult is the one that's going, wow, the odds of this happening, how many millions of kids grew up pretending they were in Kiss, jumping around, playing with somebody in Kiss, and then they actually end up doing it. So um, I, I, I dreamed that I was going to do it. And then, you know, making that into a reality was a, was an interesting process it's been the journey um, it started I'm, I'm guessing it started on the east coast you migrate you, you uh made the pilgrimage to the west coast for right. some years and then as i can see now or we were talking before the podcast you've made it back to the east coast right yeah so we came back here you know in the middle of covid we got two little kids and my wife was like you know what you know all our families on the East Coast. So why don't we just get back there? We can be closer to family. And um, and work hasn't changed for me, thankfully, you know, because I'm able to do things remotely or just need to get to an airport. So um, I was going to say, at one point, it did seem like when I moved to Los Angeles in the early 80s, you had to, it seemed to be the mecca for to be in a rock and roll band was to be in the Los Angeles music scene. Yep. But nowadays, it doesn't, maybe I'm wrong because I'm just older and I've, I've, sort of established roots in a few different places now. Um, but do you think it's really that important to be in one place or has the internet has the, just the way that music in general has gone, the, the path that it's taken, does it make it necessary, technology for instance, does it make it necessary to be in one specific city? I think if someone said, hey, I wanna move somewhere, where should I go? I still think Los Angeles for rock and roll is the best, but that said, if you're really savvy and really on top of things, yeah, you have the world on, at the end of your newsfeed, you know? So there's no reason that, that those, those people can't find out who you are. You can't make connections with people, do remote recordings with folks, um, especially for, you know, a guy like you who's been around and has those relationships, then yeah, you go anywhere because you got your phone, they can reach you and, and there you right. go, you know? 
But back in the day, and I'm talking like early 2000s after you'd moved there, was was Beautiful Creatures, was that one of the first bands who another similarity uh, besides Mickey Dolan's being a Hollywood vampire, Glenn Sobel is a honorary uh, Hollywood vampire. He plays in the band, but Glenn Sobel also played in the band Beautiful Creatures. He did. So um, how did Beautiful Creatures come about? And uh, was that one of the first uh, larger bands that you had played with or how, you know, how was that whole situation to join that band? Yeah. So that was the first band that had an actual record deal, you know, mm -hmm. that I was played with and I'll take you back. It happened at the cat club. So the, the gig happened the, the actual opportunity. Yeah. So um, there was a jam yes. there on Sundays and Joe Leste was a singer for bang tango and also beautiful creatures. Are you talking there. about a happening Harry night? Is Happen that what it Harry. was? It yes. was a happening Harry night. There, this is the first time I think we've had the podcast running for what two years now, and we have never done a proper shout out to happening Harry. So there it is, happening Harry. I would give him out. a shout out for that gig, and also Mr. Big, which is where Billy Sheehan saw me play for the first time, came up to me and talked to me, and that led to Mr. Big. So I'll give Harry so Slim Jim's Phantom, who who co owned the the. Um, the cat club folks and that was the yep. gig where the infamous stefan adika was uh was invented uh he made he cut his teeth there but we had a band called uh the star fuckers and also the other white meat and that was slim jim teddy zigzag uh gilby was in there uh, i think tracy gunn was in there as well um, of course stefan adika my buddy gilby clark who again we have another similarity uh, with gilby clark and myself, and we jam every Thursday, but they'd have other jam nights uh, with bands like on this Happen and Harry night. And apparently you've got two of your uh, prized gigs from that small little hole in the wall dive bar yeah. that uh, we love so much to play. That's cool, man. And then yep. is that, there's the album. That, that's the cover for Deuce, the second record, the one that I played on. So Glenn played on the first record, and then this is the second one that I did. Nicely done. Yeah. The whole time what you're thinking, because now that you do a lot of mentoring, you yourself had a mentor right before that, right? You had a, a, a like sort of a very famous drummer that was mentoring you. So I got out to LA. It was just hustle, hustle, hustle. Then found myself kind of got some gigs, but ended up just sort of ending up in the bar scene, which I was making a living as a musician, but not playing with with the cats that i wanted to play with so then i just started reaching out to guys and, and the first guy that I really connected with was jason sutter and jason um you know at that point i played with the new york dolls we played with american hi-fi foreigner and then he just got the marilyn manson gig after we started hanging out so he had a nice blend of like some classic rock gigs and some newer artists and chris cornelli played with it as well um so I just reached out to him and just asked him a thousand questions, but I never asked him about getting me anything. And about a year in, he goes, we, and then we became friends. And he goes, dude, I didn't know you played with Kevin Debro. And I realized I never talked about myself when I talked to him. I didn't say, well, I've done this and this, and I want to do more. I just said, you tell me, how did you do that? What was that like? What was that experience? How do you look at this? If you're negotiating, what do you, I, I, I just, I never talked about myself. Yeah. And I, when he said that to me, I, I realized, wow, you, you didn't talk about So yourself. maybe he was mentoring you without even knowing he was mentoring you. You were just asking a lot of questions, but you were taking it all in. And you've been able to take that information and now pass it on to others. Yeah, and I, I think from what I experienced knowing at age eight, what I wanted to do, not even realizing that I knew what I wanted to do, but I just opened up Kiss Alive too and was like, yup, whatever this is, I don't know what they do in here, but that, I'm that, <laughs> I want to be in that. And that's all I want to do. And so, um, but you know, then getting to my late thirties and having done a couple things, but not really doing it at that level I wanted to be doing. And I realized like something is missing here. And the good news is I was the problem. <laughs> so mm. I, can, I can, I can deal with me. If it's the world that's the problem or the industry, I can't change that, but I can maybe change me. So that was that transformation. And so that's why 
I want to pay it forward because I see so many, we, we, you know, we, I'm sure you got a guy in your mind. Yeah. I go that guy you grew up with who was amazing and just whatever happened to him. I don't know. You know, he just, it didn't Steve Phillips out. was my first guitar player. I, I mentioned him on the podcast before my first guitar teacher that I have that, that taught me all those riffs, taught me the Peter Frampton riffs, taught me smoke on the water, mm. taught me the uh, stones, uh, jumping Jack flash. And he had the cool hair. He had the cool mustache, 70s style, looked a little bit like Lindsey Buckingham. Yeah. But you mentioned something just now that I've never, just until now, I haven't really put the correlation it's about the live album because you said Kiss Alive 2 was the album that made you say, I don't know what it is, but I want to do I want to do that. Right. For me, it was Cheap Trick at Budokan. Yep. All right. And there was even another live album before that, even when I was even younger, called The Osmonds Live. Remember the mm -hmm. Osmond Brothers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Crazy Horses. And, well, Crazy Horses. See, thank you for name calling out that album because to me. If you listen to Crazy Horses, and I don't know which Osmond brother it is, but there's one of the Osmond brothers that is a dead ringer, Axl Rose's voice. It's you know the bass player because he sings Mr. Taxi. Hey, Mr. Taxi. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> and I'm like, who is this dude? <laughs> so like, that album, Crazy Horses, is one of the most rock and roll, like heavier albums of of my childhood because I, yeah. I i grew up with with bubblegum pop bobby sherman david cassie partridge family i mentioned a lot on the pod but uh yeah the osmond brothers but then when I, I i say i got into my more sort of uh guitar heroes that are, are today it was you know eddie van halen peter mm -hmm. frampton and of course that cheap trick album but it's very cool that that kiss alive too is your sort of light bulb moment album. And then you're now, you know, currently or just finished up a tour with Ace Fraley playing in the band. You did a bunch of shows this year. And uh, congrats on that, by the way. I mean, I know it's, it's like we like to talk about the past a lot, but I also like to pepper in the future right now. So how was this last year of touring with you guys? It's been great. It's been great. You know, we we typically we our first four way foray back into touring, as you know, was with you guys, Alice Cooper Band. Um, last year we did like five weeks and that was awesome. And then this year we've been back out doing like I would say like two weekends every month. I'm never good with dates. Like people know how many dates they played in a year. I never know. Uh, but we go out, you know, a couple of times every month for a few shows each run. And it's been great. I think the, you know, the, the gratitude that you feel from the fans that they're so happy to be back out there and we're so happy to be back out there playing and hanging out with each other. There's always that gratitude because we get to do this for a living, which is amazing. But especially after the, the two year hiatus that most of us were forced to take, um, there's just a lot of joy and a lot of uh, happiness and the attendance has been really good as too. And fast forward all the way up to today, uh, I want to get this in before we go too deep into the podcast. You have plans of uh, going back out on tour very, very soon. And that is uh, with the, I love, I love saying this name, the Ho Ho Hoey Holiday Tour. Say that five times, you might turn into a, uh, not a pumpkin, what will you turn into? A pine cone? An ho 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 Holiday Tour. That's with Gary Ho Hoey. There he is. Wow. Mm -hmm. Vic, is our producer, I got to say, we talked about this two minutes before the podcast stopped, and now he's got all these graphics up. If you're listening to us on the audio broadcast, thank you so much. But you know what? You've got to come over here to YouTube, YouTube official, Ryan Roxy official, and uh, watch the actual video version because you get to be in the live chat as well. We're here with Matt Starr. Uh, tell us about this Ho Ho Holiday, Hoey Holiday Tour. So this is something I think Gary's on his 25th year of doing this. So he had done a cover of the song, The Grinch, way back when. Wow. It's kind of a heavy rock cover. And um, it did really well. And so his his uh, manager at the time suggested, hey, maybe you should do a um, holiday tour show. And he thought, I don't know, that's kind of. And anyway, he did it. And here we are, however many years later. So Gary and I met uh, several years ago in Los Angeles. One of those things you play with somebody and halfway through the song, you just look at each other. You're like, we got we to gotta do something. And um, so I've, I've done it the last three years, I believe. This will be the third year. And um, yeah, it's, you know, he's, he does a great job of taking these classic Christmas songs, 
but putting a heavy riff at the front of it like the ventures would do right they come out with this this riff and then it would slink into jingle bells you know and then they go back to the riff <laughs> so he's really good at he's a producer as well so he's just a great um his great arrangements they're a lot of fun and i love christmas music so it's a really like celebratory evening that's great and, how, and uh, you kick that off uh, real soon yeah 25th of uh, november uh so we got east coast All the way states, up, yeah. you know and then we start making our way out west very good, Ben. Well, look for that out there. And um, I will get to all the uh, contact information just a little bit. But you mentioned production. You said uh, Gary's a producer as well as you are a producer. Um, what was your first big deep dive into music production? And what was it that uh, made you want to produce? I remember I had a one of those kind of glorified uh, suitcase record players but it had speakers on the side so it folded up but they had speakers on the side and you could take them off and there was cables and you could set them up which i always felt the need to let my neighbors know what i was listening to so i put them <laughs> facing out into the neighborhood thinking they needed to hear aerosmith live bootleg for some reason or another <laughs> so <Another> live album <laughs> again yep um one of the cables came loose and i'm listening to uh walk this way and i'm like something's wrong because I'm just hearing Brad Whitford and I'm not hearing Joe. And I realized, Oh my God, there's these two guys are playing completely different things. Yeah. And so I started plugging and unplugging the speakers and listening to what was going on. And that's when I, you know, and not realizing just started to dissect things and understand how things went together. And I, I was always, if I liked a song, I would literally listen to it 30 times in a row. You know, and, and you just drill it in, drill it in and start to pick it all apart. So that was kind of the beginning of just the thing that came the interest, about yeah. organically. Yeah, organically. And then um, first record I produced, I can't remember what that was, but I, I, I think doing records with other producers like Mike Chapman, who produced uh, Blondie and The Knack and. Um, yeah. the and the, the sweet the yes of artists. course and yeah. working with these different producers and watching them and how they worked and i'm going oh, okay i see what he's doing or like he's gonna i'm listening going is he gonna say something about that because whatever that guy just played doesn't work and then like the way he would come around and then oh and by the way or what and i go wow so you got to be on that. sessions with mike chapman one of my favorite producers yeah yeah i did a record with him all right Amazing. The Knack, The Knack, one of, one of my favorite albums as well, you know. Still to this day, uh, probably top top five guitar solos of all time, you know. Bur the extended yeah. version. Yes, not not the not the chopped version. Oh, it's <laughs> such a beautiful solo. So good. <laughs> but you know, when you said that about the us, uh, Aerosmith live bootleg and you had that moment where it cut off and it was like, hey, where's Joe? I had the same experience with Van, my, the first Van Halen record because I think the cat had chewed one of my speaker wires and all of a sudden one day I, I, I only, I couldn't hear the guitar. I was like, where, the, where did the guitar all go? And right. I can only hear a bunch of reverb coming out of this left side. So that was, uh, obviously I love those panning tricks and if you go back to, I mean, it gets more and more uh, intense when the, almost like the further you go back, like if you listen to old Beatles albums, you, you don't even recognize the song if you're not listening to, you know, a stereo version of some of those later records because right. things were so hard panned. Do yeah, you, well, Capitol really loved to, you know, the all the the UK releases for the Beatles were were in mono. Mono, yes. But Capital in America wanted to, you know, stereo, dun dun dun. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. kick drums over here, vocals over there, snare drums over here. It's like, you know, it, but some of them are really, I, I think, I don't know what your feeling is, but like, it's very artsy. Obviously, they were trying to demonstrate that this is stereo. And Stereoscopic noise. sound, yes. They didn't, yeah. they didn't have the nice logo, stereoscopic sound. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. But I think it kind of added to the artsiness of it, even though the Beatles initial uh, vision was what the mono mixes were. Notoriously, right. they would leave when Jeff, uh, Jeff uh, Emmerich would do the stereo mix. They do the mono and they go, OK, great. I'm going to do the stereo That's for true. America. All right. We're going to go get a coffee. Bye. You know. 
we, I think we read the same books because uh, I yeah. read that autobiography of Jeffrey Emick and I, yeah. and because he spelled it Geoffrey, I was always like with a G and not a J cause I'm American. And I just think that simply it's like, no, Geoffrey, it was, it was actually Jeffrey as well. Jeffrey Emmerich has a great biography. What, what was that called? Um, is, is that all you need is ears or is that George Martin's? That might've been George Martin's because okay. Peter Brown is all you need is love. Yeah. And that was that was a great Beatles documentary in its outright. But Jeffrey Emmerich's one is a really great sort of uh, perfect view of a fly on the wall view of what it was like to be in the studio with George Martin and the Beatles. Because he Jeffrey Emmerich was one, you know, their main engineer. Right. And you realize, too, I mean, we know this from making records, but how integral the engineer is to the sound of a record. So the producer may have the vision and the producer may know how to deal with the lead singer, but man, it's the guy placing that microphone and turning those knobs. I mean, you have such a huge influence on the sound of that record. I'm telling you. And so many great engineers become great producers. Uh, you know, one of my favorite engineer producer guys that is the guy that worked on my first album with dad's porno mag, uh, uh, Jim Mitchell. You know, it was he was actually also the main engineer uh, for a bunch of the records, uh, Appetite for Destruction, Use Your Illusions uh, records. And plus, he worked with Slash's when I played with Slash and the solo stuff. So Jim Mitchell, every single day, it's that guy that is able to dial up that tone. And do you feel that you're a, a, a better producer or better engineer or are you a combination of both? Producer produce okay yeah because i when i started producing bands i was doing everything so i had a studio i'm bringing them in i'm setting up the mics and i just realized i don't like setting up the microphones i like s figuring out which mic i want and where but i don't like setting it up i don't like plugging and then okay this channel's not working troubleshooting and i don't i didn't like mixing because it was so competitive that's something like you know as we got into the late 70s you'd start having a scenario where a guy would would record it and then another guy would mix it yes yes so it's so competitive and i just realized you know what i'm not that good at it and i don't have the the drive to get better at it so i'm just going to leave it and then that bit of clarity goes i'm just going to produce like a traditional old school producer and then i will hire an engineer and put the studio into because you know what you know what feels right in a song you know what a song the vibe of it what you don't know how maybe how to dial it up per se to the best sonic level you could get by but to get it to that that you know you're right those those mixer guys are are insanely talented and they and they can deal with frequencies like nobody's business but yeah i i, I kind of feel that uh, that way about myself a bit is that i've always known what i know sounds right i just don't know how to get that sound i know when i hear it Right. And I think mixing, especially, you know, the in the box world, it's it's changed like the art of producing hasn't that hasn't changed. The art of being a drummer, eh, not really, you know, but the art of mixing from 1980 to today, there's so many things and new things you can do to get this and that and that and this. And it's just a mind blowing. I mean, just something as simple as sound replacement, which is that's certainly, you know, 25 years old now. But that's a game changer, man. You know, so you're not going to worry well, about the snare drum. And the actual, what, what is like in vogue, you know, what a snare drum in the 80s does not work today in a 2020 song, or maybe it does. I'm not sure. But, you know, I just remember a snare drum back in the 80s rock ballad having a reverb that went on until next Tuesday. Exactly. <laughs> Right. But and then there was a little you know, then some more of the indie bands and more of the, uh, you know, alternative bands started using a piccolo snare. And that right. seemed to be the sound for a while. And yep. then and then same thing with radio, uh, radio voice production with your, you know, you, you put your a head. What is it called? A headphone when you sing into an actual head vocoder, like a vocoder, yeah. well, not the vocoder, but sounding like you came through a telephone line. That oh, became right. a bit that was a very popular thing for vocals in like the 90s and stuff. Right. And, and, and it's not you don't hear it as much today. So that's the sound is actually evolving. But I guess the art of a good song 
never changes. If you have a good song in the 60s or a good song in 2020, it's, it's a good song. Yeah, it's just melody and lyrics and you're touching someone in their heart and they go, I want to have that feeling again. Let me let me request it and back in the day at the call and request it or just let me play it again. I want to hear it again. I want that song in my life, I think is really like when you get to this hit thing where you might go, oh, that's a catchy song. But they'll, you hear another one, you go, I want that in my life. I want that on my phone. I want that in my playlist. I want that at my mm-hmm. wedding, whatever. That's like when you get to that next level, the person wants to relive that feeling. So I think that's... That's kind of the, the difference. But what's what's it like for you to listen to music these days, mostly out of your phone, when you are, and this brings us to our first uh, hot topic, if you will, because we actually have, yeah, logos and all that stuff for it. It's our hot topic one. Um, you are a self-proclaimed audiophile, you, which meaning it's not, folks, don't freak out. Don't cancel Matt Starr yet. He's an audiophile. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, and audio. He's self-pro- audio audio get it through your heads and uh this came through enjoythemusic.com what we do is we like to take a headline or a a feature and we see it and i and this one really struck me because you are truly into high fidelity and you do spark that story you mentioned that story in the interview about that uh aerosmith record of how that first sparked your interest but uh how do you feel now when you when you're making records, you're producing records that 90% of the people are going to be listening to it, you know, on something the same out of this. I I play for the medium, you know, and so I have my two worlds. So if I'm listening to music at home for enjoyment, it's a record, it's on my system, I'm sitting down, I'm relaxed, the lights are dim. Any other time I'm listening to music, yeah, I either have earbuds or it's coming out of my phone and I'm aware of that. So that has changed how I play drums in the studio. That has changed uh, some of the sounds that I've gotten, you know, and that- What ways it change you playing drums? So my groove is a big part of how I play, but I don't know what's going to happen to that recording, that track that I cut on the other side. They might- and I don't want to get too into the technical side, but you know, like they might quantize it. They might gate all this stuff and only have the snare going. Dish, dish. So I have to do things like that. Even if you take that and, you know, make Cut it, it all up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's still like, Oh, that's, that's a certain style of fill. That's a guy. That's something Matt would do. Hopefully. It sounds like a real, yeah. Sounds like a guy in, in the recording studio playing it. Yeah, and, and I and I tend to play more fills than I normally would. Like my for me, Phil Rudd and Simon Kirk, those are like two of my go to guys as far as just incredible drummers and just fantastic. But um you just do that and you might understand like a drum machine. So I'm gonna go ba da ba ba and like big cozy Powell fill to to give it the character where normally I'd let the snare tone and the ghost notes and all that be the character, but that might all get taken out by the time the thing gets mixed. So I think I've been more kind of more forward with my my playing and again, playing more fills. To put your stamp on it a little bit, to put a little bit more of your stamp. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah. And to give it that, that character, you know? Wow, okay, cool. I, that, that's really cool that you actually uh, have adjusted your your the way you record because of the technology. In a sense. To- totally. And I think, too, like, again, if I have my choice, I'm going to listen to something on vinyl. But the fact that the records I make usually get listened to in a speaker that's like this big, that's fine. That's OK. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I'm not mad about it. You know, it's like I have my thing in my life and then the world is what it is. And I'm glad I don't have to carry around a boom box anymore to listen to music. You know, <laughs> like we got phones and I can have a thousand songs. In there. So that's it. The technology is good. But, you know, it has affected things, you know. Well, you said putting the lights down and, and, you know, listening to it on your your system. Speakers obviously set apart for that stereoscopic sound. Um, yes. Are you listening to your favorite songs through uh, CD, 8-track, or is it the old school vinyl album? Vinyl into a tube preamp, into a tube power amp, into a pair of speakers. Wow. So... so- and, and where's your sweet spot? Where's, where's your volume sweet spot? Seven, 
seven and a half? Is it? I actually have a DB meter because I, <laughs> and I don't use it all the time, but I sometimes I listen and go, God, I think I'm listening loud, you know, and I don't want to, it seems to be around 80 DB is where it ends up being right. So, you know, we do the triangle. So basically as, about as far apart as the speakers are from each other they should each be that far from you and your listening position and that's a good you know real good See, rule of thumb we're, we're gonna try that next time we go on tour together with ace freely and alice cooper or maybe another band that you're in well, um because i see a long list of bands that you have uh, I'm, you're going to come into the dress room and i'm going to turn you on to goliath because the good people over at gentle x speakers uh just recently uh, made me a, a wardrobe case uh, slash speaker uh, sort of listening booth. Amazing. And, it, and it's the same size as a wardrobe case. So you open it up, you got a little bit of a, a stereoscopic sound. You got two really great gentle X speakers with a, with a sub and anybody, the idea is that anyone can come. Well, there you go. He went away for a little bit, but I'll go, I'll tell the story. Uh, the idea is you can go into any sort of room and um, anybody can hook up really quick with Bluetooth and play their favorite song. So there it is. Next time uh, Matt Starr comes to a show, comes on to backstage, he'll be able to play one of his songs. But next time he leaves the podcast, he's going to leave me at full screen. But what a better time for me to just talk about stuff. Like I'm just talking about Goliath. And uh, Matt's coming back. One second, though. Um, Vic, because now is a good time for me to take a quick break and thank a few of our sponsors that we have right now. Again, asking you guys to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, because uh, you have been great supporters of the podcast so far. We are here with uh, drummer and producer and mentor, uh, Mr. Matt Starr. But our podcast has also uh, helped out and uh, sort of gives us a lot of support, uh, whether it's with clothes that we're wearing, whether it's with um, the, advice, the devices that I'm using. I'm using these great biodynamic uh, earbuds today. Usually I have the big headphones on, but I'm using it um, with the earbuds today just to check it out, see how it sounds. It sounds good for me. And uh, again, how about a little picture, Vic? If you got Rock and Free Life and Athletic Sleaze Wear, I posted a lot of this stuff up over uh, the last few uh, months with me posting up because I only bring basically two sets of clothing on the road with me. But uh, the hats that I've been wearing lately are rock and free life. So go check them out. They're on Instagram. And that one beautiful little uh, sweatsuit that I have an athletic sleaze. Got to check out athletic sleaze as well. Um, I was going to do a big promotion for athletic sleeves. I just have to talk to them, make sure they're ready for your guys' orders. Because a lot of people ask me, how can I get uh, that same type of sort of sweatsuit, leisure suit, athletic sleeve suit, and um, they're preparing them. I think they got the sizing already, so I'll be putting uh, some ads out, and maybe you want to check down there in the uh, description of this video right now to see if I have those links up already. So look forward to that. Thank you very much, Rockin' for Life. Thank you, Athletic Sleeves. And let's bring back uh, drummer, producer, mentor, Matt Starr. There you go, buddy. What happened? Again, you just disappeared. It's just a weird little drop panic I, I i know that you have the genelec in your wardrobe case with the subwoofer <laughs> and, and I, you know i just say next time you come on you're just going to have to bring some of your music some yeah. music either you produced or that you're on and we'll just crank it up and it's really has i i think we're definitely listening to it louder than 80 db it's about you know I think we're up in the 100s at that point but it's a it's a great way to get pumped up for a show now yeah you know listening to loud music. Cause I think we've gotten so used to listening to things, which is fine. Like you said, you can have a thousand songs on your, on your, uh, on your phone, but to actually feel a song, you know, feel that, that, that's that subwoofer come through. There, there's nothing like it, you know, and, te and again, technology is amazing. I mean, the fact that, you know, you could have a speaker like this big in your house, a couple of those and it's around and you feel like you're watching star Wars, you feel like you're in outer space. That's great. But there's nothing like a kick drum through a big ass speaker. You know, you're just moving the air and it's <laughs> that's it, man. I love it. I love it. Well, hey, here we go. We've already done our, our commercial break. We've already um, we'll do a little bit of uh, fact or fiction, a little bit of um, we'll never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Um, mm -hmm. There is a rumor going around because you said you were into vinyl. 
uh, you have a you have a record player, but the uh, the rumor around is that you have over three thousand LPs. Is that uh, is that a fact or is that uh, completely fiction? That is a fact. Much there you go, Vic. Yes. That's a fact. You can yeah. bank that. Where do you keep three thousand albums, record albums? Wherever I can. I have to say, shout out to my wife. We've been together 20 years. And every time we've moved, we'd go, oh, I, you know, we want this. We want that. Yeah, there she is. Oh, and, that's great. And But it would always be like, oh, this wall, we could put the records. Because 3,000 records, it's not as much, as, it doesn't take up as much space as you think. But it does take up a considerable amount of space. So we actually have, yep, there they are with the kids. <laughs> and I say, don't touch those records. Stay away from those records. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this. Did, did, did that album collection make it all the way um, from the West Coast to the East Coast? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. records are, you know, every time I would pack up the boxes, I think, you know, I don't know, maybe digital isn't so bad, <laughs> you know, because it's like <laughs> it, records are just dead weight. There's nothing you can do. They take up as much space as they take up. That's just the way it goes. So, um, but yeah, we always have furniture that, you know, accompanies the records. And uh, I think it's cool because it, it's like having a library, you know? I love it. I love it. Well, hey, you know what? Let's move on to our hot topic number two. And uh, this basically gets us a little bit to the main event. There it is. Thank you very much, Erwin, for designing that uh, beautiful logo there. And uh, Vic, for putting up all these great graphics on our video uh, podcast. Check out the video link if you are listening to the audio version. Come on over to Ryan Roxy uh, Official on the YouTube channel and just hit that like and subscribe button. Thanks again. Um, I know I say it a lot, folks, but it's just getting those eyeballs. We want to get more eyeballs on the podcast so we can get more interviews with uh, special guests like Matt Starr that we have today. So our hot topic number two uh, – actually comes from your own website. Uh, and we're going to talk about this called Matt Star Coaching because I mentioned in the intro that I love, um, I love self-help. I love mentoring. I love, if you will, passing the torch on to the next generation because I had some great mentors over my life. I mean, Alice Cooper being probably the biggest mentor for me and um, much in the way that, uh, that, that Sean was a, was a mentor for you. Um, but um, self-help, mental health, and mental health, it all has to do about mindset. And you have come up with this uh, theory or I guess saying, I don't know what you would call it, but it's called the rock star code and how it can work for you. So talk to us about, you know, where Matt Star Coaching why did it come about? What was the reason for it? And if people want to find out more about it, uh, what can they expect? Yeah. So again, just from my own story, um, we tend to think if we're not, especially musicians, uh, if, if they're not having the career, the success that they want, you know, the thought is, well, I'm not, I must not be good enough because only the best musicians get the best gigs, as you know, not true. <laughs> there's some great musicians with some great gigs. And then there's some amazing gigs that people are doing. And you're going, yeah, I mean, the guy does a fine job, but it's not just, but musicians, that's all we think. I got to get better. I got to practice. I got to practice. And for me, you know, I, late thirties and that's not, one part of it. That's just one part of it is a practice. small part of it, small yeah. part of it. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know the rest cause I didn't know anyone who was doing it. So I didn't have anyone else who could tell me all they had were other musicians that were like, yeah, you got to practice. You got to get better. And that's not the case. So once I figured out all the other stuff, which is here and here, you know, it's just the mindset, the thoughts, and then are the emotions in alignment with the thoughts. And if they're not, they're going to get mixed up and you're going to get stuck. And then you're going to start telling yourself that, you know, Maybe depending on your personality, you're going to say it's because of the music business or you're going to say it's because of this or you're going to blame yourself and beat yourself up. None of those things are true, but our brain tries to make sense out of it. Yeah. And that's kind of where I was stuck for many years. And once I got through that and I got to the other side, it almost immediately like got the gig with Ace and then got the call from this guy, got the call. And I'm like, 
I felt like there was like a backlog of all this awesome stuff that the universe was waiting to give me. I just had to get my shit together. What's yeah. the first step in getting your shit together? Yeah, with Ace. And I, 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 we played three games of pool. I beat them in two games and maybe even one game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you couldn't have won all three because that would have gone against the rock star code you yeah know? you exactly. might have been out of a gig really quick exactly you, <laughs> you know and i think to the you know your question about the rock star code what i realized is you know what do i love about jimmy page what do i love about keith richards there's all the rock star ism but i really am inspired because they're exceptional you know and so like you think of keith and there's always it's always attached with the drug use and this and that that most people who do drugs end up doing nothing, not making sticky fingers, not making let it bleed into sticky fingers into exile. If you right. most people that did that many drugs over four years would end up dead. That's he's like the most prolific guy in the world during that time. So this is an exceptional human being. He's successful despite the substance. So when mm. I kind of realized that and I thought, holy cow. This, the, the ability, the will to just have this, this level of creativity and push forward. These are exceptional people. And, and you know this from, you know, hanging out with Alice and all these other people. They're exceptional. They're not better than someone else because they're more successful, but they are exceptional human beings. And so that to me is the rock star code. It's not getting your picture taken and living in the Hollywood Hills, which is awesome, by the way. We have nothing <laughs> against that. And that's a whole other thing when, you know, there's like this anti-wealth, anti-success mentality. If you're no, anti- The will to have, you have to, you have to accept it. I think because as musicians, we're, we don't accept it so easily because we're so used to being turned down in so many ways. We have to almost understand that, hey, this gig is offered to you. You take it, you accept it, and you embody that gig, whatever gig it is you get. I agree. And there's there's that association with, I think, art in general. And, you know, and it goes way back and we don't need to go into all this, but it's like it's tied into, you know, spirituality in a bullshit way. You know, poor is honest and, and rich is dishonest and you're clean if you don't have money holding you down. It's bullshit. And but we we get so caught up in that. And then you see a picture of Joe Perry with ripped jeans and he looks like he's from the streets. And it's like he was driven in a Rolls Royce to that to the, shoot. To, to that you know photo I mean? shoot. Yeah, exactly. So we don't see that. I, at least I didn't as a kid, you know, so I thought I got to keep it real and all that. So, yeah, all these little things, they just get in the way. And, and the way I, I'd say it is, that, you know, how do you know if your mindset's where you want to be? Are you living your dreams? Are, are you living your dreams or living a version and moving forward? If you are, it's probably in alignment. And if you're not, it isn't, you know? Okay. So you, you talk a little bit before about blocks and I, and, and how, you know, you can be in a flow. You can, I, I, I um, you know, I have a, I have a thing called reality trans surfing that I sort of follow and I don't really turn that many people onto it. Some people, I, I don't want to, go to over the deep end over it, but it works for me, this reality trans mm -hmm. right? Riding the wave of success, if you will. Yeah. But every once in a while, that wave is gonna come down. And maybe that's the same thing as having a block. But how do you deal, whether it's energy blocks, uh, performance blocks, writer's blocks, um, what, are your, so what are some tips that you have to get to punch and break those blocks down? Sure. So the very first thing is just acceptance. So if you're having a slow month or a slow year, or you're not feeling creative, or you're not feeling energetic, or you're not feeling whatever, or you're feeling downright depressed, the first thing is to just accept it. Because if you resist it, then there's a, now there's an inner conflict inside of you. And that's not conducive to moving forward or success of any kind. So have acceptance of where you are and have compassion for yourself. Um, uh, things are slow right now. I'm a little worried about how I'm going to pay my bills or I'm feeling bad. I'm looking at all my buddies. They're out on tour and I haven't been on the road in six months. Okay. You know, not feel sorry for yourself, but just have compassion for yourself and wherever you're at and to not fight it. And so acceptance doesn't mean that we, we like it. It just means we accept it. Then, like that's one, 
Now right. we've done one. Let's do that thoroughly and acknowledge, right? And then the second thing is, what can I do to change that? You know, and for me, I bring in, you know, the universe, I bring in God and I just say, tell me what you'd have me do. You know, this is what I would like. Guide me. Let me know. What do you need me to do? And sometimes that's as it's literal as a piece of paper, set my timer for 15 minutes. God, what would you have me do today? Question mark. And I just sit there, see what comes up, write it down. Sometimes it might sound crazy, whatever I get. And I go, mom, write it down. I'm not going to question it. You know, I'm just going to take that action. So it's, but that very first step, I think is the one that most people miss. And I've been doing some work with, um, with veterans groups uh, through uh, Rick Allen's foundation called Raven Drum Foundation and dealing with PTSD cool. and stress and all this. And the, the first thing, first thing, because those guys are heroes. They go, yeah, you know, I'm fine. It's like, no, no, I'm not going to baby you. I'm not having pity on you, but we need to acknowledge what you went through and go, that's a lot. That's a lot. Let's just sit with that. We're not going to sit in this all day, but let's just sit with that. I hear you. And to be validated. Okay, cool. Now, what's the action? But if you skip that first step, then again, you get that inner conflict going on. And that just causes so many, so many problems. So it sounds to me that Matt Star Coaching is much more than just musician, much more than just musicians based. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was initially what I, what I set out to do. And then I started having people reach out and say, hey, I'm not a musician, but I own a business or I'm not a musician, but I'm an athlete. You know, is this something? And yeah, the, the principles are universal. It's just, you know, taking that thought in your head and making it a physical reality. You know, how do we do that? Well, there's a little uh, you have a little bonus on your website because I actually went on the website, folks, and I, I encourage you guys to do so as well. We're going to put up those uh, actual uh, mattstarcoaching.com links and a lot of Matt's other uh, links in just a second. But if you go onto the website and you do click on a uh, I don't know what picture it is, it might be upper left picture, but you're going to get an actual sort of bonus um, sort of feature, you will actually get a setting your rate, uh, basically PDF. And you, and you basically give a lot of tips of how, and I guess this would work not just with musicians, but I found it very helpful if you're trying to negotiate a contract, if you're a musician and negotiate a salary, it could work for other jobs as well. But it was, it's great the way you break it down of how you can sort of negotiate what raise is right for you and what sort of salary would be right for you all on this PDF. And uh, that you just give away for free right there on the website. Love it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because that's from, if I'm talking about something, chances are that didn't come naturally. That's why I had to go through it step by step by step by step. And then I look back and go, what did I do? Oh, step one, I did this step two, step three. You know, you ask me, could you show me how to find true love? No. I can't. I just stumbled into my relationship with my wife. I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm present. I try my best. But that's not something that was a challenge for me. So I can't really explain it. I go, I don't know. Just be a nice guy and keep your eyes open, I guess. But <laughs> this music stuff or the career stuff was a real challenge. And money is, is always an issue. And something I bring up too, musicians, if you go to get a regular job, you go, hi, I'm Matt. Here's my resume. Oh, you had six years of experience. Okay, great. All right, we'll pay you this much. Okay, how about this much? Okay, shake hands. Thanks. Go talk to Marsha. You come in on Monday. You're not talking about money again. You're done. Mm -hmm. If we're lucky, we're talking about money several times a day. And if you're not comfortable talking about money, it's going to be a problem. You know, so I think, again, back to my previous answer, like if, if I, like I can be, if you're uncomfortable with money, accept that. We talk about money a lot. That can be uncomfortable. You okay? Okay, yes. You acknowledge that? Great. Now, we're going to take action to make sure that things move forward, you know, and, and, and are in a successful way. But, yeah, so that's what that PDF is. And then I always sneak stuff in there. I say, you know, we... Oh, boy. Go ahead. Continue Sorry, reach that. out to three people that are more successful than you. And so, like, you're getting their input on your rate, but you're also networking. Hmm. So it's... Well, like and and, and goes back to the way you were mentored in the beginning. Ask a lot of questions. Try to ask as many questions as possible. 
And I'm not sure if you heard my last point, but uh, you might be messing with your audio. Hold on. We For some reason, I'm not hearing you. All right. Don't worry. You can always leave and then come on back into the into the chat. Yeah. Jump it's on and come back. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Trading oh, cards. we'll talk about that in just a second there, Vic. Oh, our producer. He always like sneaks a photo in. Um, and there you go. It is Veterans Day. Is it today, Vic? Give us a little yes. He gave us a big thumbs up. It is yesterday, or it is today, or wherever you're listening to it. We should be celebrating veterans all the time. Put that picture back up. Happy Veterans Day, everybody. And um, then again, let me talk real quickly. Thank a vet today. There you go. Not a veterinarian, an actual veteran. And uh, and thank a veterinarian if you see them, because there are probably some veterinarians that are vets, veterans as well. I'm spending way too much time on the V word. We're back here with Matt Starr on In the Trenches. Um, real quick, actually, because um, I am excited about uh, our guest next week. And this is a very big surprise announcement that we have. Um, while you're here, Matt, we're going to put a big picture of our guest because it will be none other than Crossbone Scully. Yeah. That's next Friday, November 18th. It's a big mystery surrounding it. And so we're going to have um, one of the biggest, uh, probably the closest friends of Crossbone Scully on the podcast to talk about it. So um, that's all I'll say for right now. Stay tuned this next week. We'll have a lot of um, sort of unveiling of that episode. But uh, let's continue with Matt Starr. Are you, has your audio and how is for an audio file, we're having a couple visual audio things going on today. You, you know what? Okay? I, yeah, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. All right. We're, we're back. Um, now that we are back and before we get all the um, contact information for people to come check out, um, not just uh, mattstarcoaching.com, but all the other social media uh, platforms, let's go for our fan of the week. What do you say, Vic? Shall we, uh, let's, shall we uh, sort of celebrate our, our this week's fan of the week on In the Trenches? Here we go. He might not have his own trading cards, but guess what? He's Dan George, and he's an ultimate 77 fan. Dan George, you are a great uh, a great fan of the week. And if you're interested in becoming a fan of the week, all you have to do is promote this episode. Uh, tell a bunch of – tell three friends that are more successful than you uh, about this podcast, and we'll be uh, happy <laughs> – that, that, if you can. That works, all right. <laughs> and so, Dan George, you are a fan of the week. Thank you very much. We are, we are back with Matt Starr. Um, there you go. Uh, Dennis Barkley says, uh, thanks, Ryan and Matt, for a great show. Very inspiring words. I love it. And Dennis is a great follower and supporter of the podcast. Appreciate it. And again, next week, Crossbone Scully will be our featured guest. So, um, we talked about it before. It was a rumor going on, but I think uh, Vic sort of uh, unearthed the, the, the rumor. Um, were you a baseball fan, football fan, sport fan at all? Or um, what happened and how did a tr uh, Matt Starr trading cards come about? <laughs> I, I was not a sports fan. I wasn't really an athlete. I'm not that physical of a, of a person, uh, but <laughs> But I like the collecting part, right? So my friends had baseball cards and I like I like collecting. And so thankfully, Kiss cards came out and I was able to collect those, you know. Um, wow. And I had somebody ask me uh, about uh, two years ago, hey, would you be interested in doing your own trading cards? And I'm like, do you know me at all? Like, <laughs> of course, you know, hey, would you want to go see Cheap Trick front row and then go backstage and meet Rick Nielsen and talk about his guitar? He's like, <laughs> uh, yeah. Hello. So there they are. That, that Those are the Matt Star trading cards. Um, how does one go about getting some? And and what? how many cards do you have? And what do what do the back of the cards just say? Because usually they have statistics on stuff. How does that, how does that go about? Totally, yeah. So that first set, for that first set is, is four cards. And and our uh, our CDC rep, the wonderful Judy Wan, took that picture of me sitting on the trailer smoking a cigar. 
Let's go back to those. All right. Yeah. Shout out to Judy One. Yeah, she's There's a the lot best. of shout outs today. Happening Harry and Judy One all in the same episode. I can't believe it. The, the upper right. I'm in the back. That's probably like the merch truck or something. And I'm sitting on the on the tailgate yeah. having a cigar as I would. That was on our tour. I yeah. Love it. <laughs> and yep. of course you have one behind the gong so what do the back the back of the statistics say on the card yeah so the backs have stats like interesting facts you know matt star was the drummer for this thing matt star played on the song and then it has like where they'd have the stats it has records i played on and and then bands i've played with so the the guys that put this together just did a great job of getting every little detail like there's little details and different things Personal. Can they find those on your website or where was the best way to get those? Uh, they can just reach out to me. They can just either go to like uh, Facebook or Instagram, just send me a message and, uh, right. or they can message me through my site, Matt Star Music. Yeah. Well, there we go. We'll get, we'll get those uh, links up in just a second, but first um, enough of my yak and enough of my questions. It's time for the people to speak. And uh, actually someone got in touch with me this week uh, that was very influenced by you. Um, perhaps maybe even mentored by you, but they had some questions. So it's our segment called Let the People Speak. <laughs> and this comes from at nush.unbrushed. You might know at nush.unbrushed. That's good. You got your glasses on for that one. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> had them at the ready. Is there anyone left on your bucket list that you want to play with? Because it seems like you have played with so many uh, of these big names. I know we've talked a lot about Ace. We, I didn't get a chance to talk to you so much, of, you know, about, about, about so many of the others. Joe Lynn Turner, I'm a big fan of. Love, Hate, Kevin Dubrow, and Mr. Big. There you go. All mm -hmm. huge names. Um, and, of course, you got to play with the very, very uh, infamous Dizzy Reed and his band, Hookers and Blow. Of yeah. course. <laughs> so fun. is there anyone left on the bucket list? But after you played with Dizzy, where do you go from there? Come on. Yeah. What are you talking about. I, yeah, I think for me it's like the 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 big cats, the OGs, like Jimmy Page, Pete Townsend, and Tony Iommi, I would say. And Paul Rogers. Okay. That's your big four. I love yep. it. All right. So let's move on with the second question that at Nush.unbrushed have. Um who do you respect most in the industry after all these years of being in it? Well, I've been fortunate. They say don't meet your heroes, but I really haven't had a negative experience meeting people that I, you know, um, grew up admiring. But I would say um, thus far, Paul Stanley would be at the top of that list. Do you respect most? Yeah. Yeah. You know, in what just, way? Um, again, for taking that vision and making a reality, seeing it through some hard times, you know, the level of exceptionalism, you go to see Kiss, you know, you're getting Paul 110%. There's no doubt about that. And, um, and we played together on a couple of occasions, but we did an event together and um, where we all, it was myself, Tommy Thayer and Jason Sheff from Chicago. And we did sound check. And then we went up to this suite and just sat there around the table and talked for three hours about, music and family and it was it was just a great conversation and uh you know just a very normal you know you meet people that are successful and it's it can be hard to get a word in you know and and i don't mind that you know sometimes it it was like just four dudes talking everyone was the same no one was. or sometimes you talk to them and it's almost like an interview they're almost on stage doing right. an interview right. so you got to actually uh, have some real time talk with yeah yeah and it just just the whole the way that whole night oh. went and everything there's a bunch of details there but uh yeah yeah so paul it. stanley very cool all right you know what I'd, li I'd love to have paul on the podcast as well maybe you could put a good word in for us as well i would love you to put a word into our team thank you very much to our whole entire team that's been helping out all day and uh this past week setting up the matt star Pod of Vic Chalfant, our producer, of course, Federica Roba. Uh, yes. you, you know, thank you very much for pointing it out, uh, uh, promoing out. Erwin for doing uh, some of the graphics that he did. All, of course, our Hot Topics logo is pos made possible by uh, Erwin, as well as the athletic sleaze. Um, I don't know, I'm giving a lot of credit, but guess what? Credit, you always give credit where credit is due. 
And this podcast would be nothing without uh, all their hard work and all of our audience's support. Everybody that's in the uh, live chat day in and day out. Thank you very much, Ashley. I saw that contribution you made to the podcast. Really appreciate it. And uh, now it's time to sort of Find out more about Matt Starr through his links. If you want to find out more about Matt Starr, uh, for those of people that are listening on the audio broadcast, Matt, can you uh, just tell people what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, so any of these are good because I am uh, I'm active and around. So you can message me through Facebook, message me through Instagram, or message me through my website, which is mattstarcoaching.com. And uh yeah, I'm on there. We don't need to be friends. You don't need to add me. You don't need to make sure I'm following you. I'll just, I always look in that spam folder every day to make sure I didn't miss anything. So, and that's it for those of you listening. That's at, put those links up one more time, please, more Vic. Uh, it's at Matt Star Music on Facebook and, uh, or at Matt Star Music on Instagram. Matt Star Music around the bell um, on YouTube, as well as at Matt Star Coaching on Instagram. And check out those websites, mattstarmusic.com and mattstarcoaching.com. Um, there you go, Matt. I mean, is there anything left that we can talk about besides the future? Because we got this ho ho uh, holiday tour coming up. Um, right. What about 2023? Are our paths going to cross again during that time? Yeah, I hope so. I certainly hope so. I think it's a great fit. You know, we're talking obviously about the Ace and Alice combo, which is great. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Just getting some dates in. Might be in, um, and there's going to be another Ace fairly. We're working on a new Ace record, which will be out next year. Okay. So how did your how did your connection with Gilby Clark? come about because I played with Gilby for many years and I'm just wondering how you guys, you ended up co-producing a, a, a project as well, right? Right. Yeah. So a band called Hotel Diablo, which has Alex Grossi from Quiet Riot and Mike Duda. Um, and, oh, I love Mike Duda. He's playing, yeah. uh, he's playing tonight in some town somewhere on the road with Wasp. And I just kicked his ass in golf just a couple weeks ago. So, I mean, not to brag or anything, but I don't get to kick too many people's asses in golf that often. But uh, Mike, dude, is a great guy as well. And, uh, okay, so that how, how was that album, and uh, when was that? That was, jeez, uh, pro- at, at least a decade ago, if not more. And uh, I don't know if Gilby and I had met before. You know, I don't know how how and where we met but i'm sure it was maybe cat club related or some kind of event related where we ended up playing and then <clears throat> you know just had a lot in common and we we talked about music in 1977 is a, a year that we agree is is like a pinnacle year so i love that you have the you know the 77 thing um, Absolutely. but uh yeah and then we just ended up playing together i played on his record and we've s- smoked uh many cigars together as well Ah, he's a cigar smoker. See, I'm, I've never been one of those cigar smokers, but I know he is. I know you are now. Um, I know that a lot of the bands that you've played in, you've had to fill some uh, big shoes. You know, you've had to play some tough parts uh, that, that other players had previously laid down. Um, you filled in for Pat Torpy when, when he was, you know, diagnosed early on for Mr. Big. Mm-hmm. Um you know, Alex, you actually played songs that were once handled by Anton Fig and Peter Chris. You do that still every night. Yeah. Um, what's your secret to keeping uh, the soul of the song by at the same time maintaining your own style? Or does your style have a lot to do with that soul of those songs? Well, I think I've been fortunate to play with a lot of artists that I grew up playing along to. Right. So when I played with right. Kevin DeBro, I was playing to that metal health record. I love Frankie's drumming, very Bonham. So it was just came naturally to me. I used to play to Ace's solo album all the time. So like it kind of had that thing together, you know. So so that's been a fortunate thing. But I think, again, all those years of critical listening, kind of listening like a producer type thing. What's making this song work? It, it's the parts, but there's usually something else that's making it work, making sure that's in there. And I don't really concern myself with me being in there because I'm playing the drums. So that that's me. I'll be right. there. I'm the one hitting the snare. I have my groove. I have my tones, all that. So I don't really make try and make sure that I'm putting my stamp on it because I am just by playing. So it's really about just serving the song 
And, and specifically on gigs, it's like, if I'm going to play with somebody, okay, this song came out 30 years ago. Okay. But how did they play it last month? Because it's probably evolved. Tempo might change arrangement, the intro, the outro. Yeah. So to make it comfortable for everyone, you know, weird question. I've never asked a drummer this, but when the pitch changes because guitar, because obviously many of those older songs recorded in, a certain pitch a 440 right does it change the vibe for a drummer to especially when you go on the road and perhaps maybe the vocalist is having some problems with his voice and you tune down sometimes up to a whole step does it change right. your drumming approach to play songs with different pitches yeah it might i mean i'm, I'm always listening to the vocalist so if they're having trouble getting it out i might pull back just a little to give them that space, you know? Right. Um, but obviously when you drop it, it becomes a little heavier, which right. I would tend to lean on the tempo a little bit because it could get sludgy and kind of sleepy. Uh, it, again, sounds heavier, but it, it might sound older. And if you're actually playing with someone who's in their seventies, maybe torquing it up a little bit, gives it a little jolt, makes it sound a little younger, you know? I just, I, I've never asked that question. And I never really thought of it until now, until you were describing it, the, the way you adjust your playing to certain songs. So, yeah, I was wondering if it would pitch. So it's, it's very interesting because, as you know, a lot of bands, you know, they'll record an album in standard tuning. But when they go on the road, they'll drop it down a half right. step. And then years later, they might drop it down, you know. If you're in Bon Jovi's case, you've dropped it down almost like a whole two semitones at this point, you know? Right. Yeah. Like with Joel and Turner, things were down a whole step. But I'll say something about Joe. I mean, he's such a great singer. He's very similar to Paul Rogers in that respect. You know, just these soulful, doesn't go for these crazy high notes. It just, it's so good and soulful. And I played on that gig for like a, a, a while. And then um, Steve Brown, Play with Trickster and plays. Gotta with love Steve Brown. We had him on the podcast as well. There's Joe Lynn Turner. There he love is. It. Thank you like, much, Vic. Steve was like, yeah, well, you know, we're a whole step down. Da, da, da. And I said, oh, my God, I never noticed. And usually I do notice that because Joe just just made it sound. I don't you know, I don't know. But it just it never felt like it was down. You know, the energy was just so great. And uh, the singing was like so engaging. When you played with Joe Lynn Turner, did you have interesting discussions about UFOs? Not the band UFO. Yeah. Actual UFO. No, we did not talk UFOs. I asked a lot of Cozy Powell questions, actually. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to bring that up next time. Or do Please I want to? Get, and give him a big, well, yeah, you're, you're going to definitely open up a can, a can okay. of something. Okay. Either a can of whoop ass or a can of worms. I'm not sure. Right. <laughs> but I, it's been a pleasure having you on, Matt Starr. Uh, let's put those links up one more time for the folks in case the, they didn't see it the first time. That is at Matt Starr Music, or pretty much across the board. And if you want to check out Matt Starr's coaching, you can go mattstarrcoaching.com. There you go. Again, our guest next week on the uh, podcast will be none other than Crossbone Scully. Um, Thank you guys so much for hanging out and being part of it. Um, I'm going to enjoy my weekend. Hopefully you're going to enjoy yours. Um, I usually end the podcast with asking our artists um, if they have anything sort of inspiring, a quote or some sort of words that they live by. Um, you obviously have a bunch because you have a whole coaching website. Um, but is there anything in, uh, in particular that you – that you sort of point to every time that you say, yeah, this is the way I sort of live my life. I'll share a quote that I heard this morning and I don't, I don't remember who said it, but uh, it was regarding meditation and it said a uh, half hour of meditation each day is good unless you are very busy and then you need to do an hour. Ah, very good. Do you meditate? I do. Okay. I do. Yeah. I, I have fallen off of meditation. Um, I did TM for many, many years, transcendental meditation. Yeah. Uh, and that is sort of a 20 minute regimen that you do. You fall in def definitely into a zone. It would start my day in, either in the morning or night, but uh, I have fallen off. But guess what? Maybe that means I need uh, double the amount. 
There you go. <laughs> Matt Starr, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Check everything out at mattstarcoaching.com. Hang out for just one second, Matt. Uh, everybody that's been in the chat, appreciate it. Enjoy your weekend. Tell a friend about the podcast. Let's get these numbers rolling. Uh, we'll see you next week with Crossbone Scully. Thank you, Vic. Thank you, Fetty. Thanks, everybody on the RGA team. And until next time, my name is Ryan Roxy. Enjoy the ride. See ya. See you guys. Trenches with Ryan Roxy.